Hi, and welcome back to The Queer Creative. This is Vanessa. And this is Jonah. And you'll see behind me some snapshots from the marathon. Was that last weekend? I've lost all yeah. concept of time. <laughs> last Sunday, yeah. Yeah, we have... Oh, there's all of us. There's yeah, we have me, you. Theron, his dad, Aaron, JC, JC, and, and Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. I went to Daniel's event um, Friday night. Yes, how was that? It was great. Did you get the pictures I sent you? Yes, I saw them. I, I saw some of them so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was in a church. I really enjoyed Very it. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so the marathon was last week, and I'm still tired from it. I bet. It was fun, yeah. though. What do they say about, like, post-marathon, just, like, recuperation? I don't know. I got really sick. I, I had a cold the night mm. before, so... I didn't even yeah. think I was going to run it. Yeah. Um, I only got like two hours sleep. And then I. Oh, my God. I actually got to Staten Island and I um, felt like, OK, I'll just run. I'm going to be running by my house at like mile six. So if I don't feel <laughs> well, I can just go home. Come home so that was my nap. plan. But once I started running, I was fine. <laughs> so Yeah. And then your body probably just completely shut down after that. Yeah. Um, the next day, the the cold came back and then actually two days after the marathon is mm -hmm. when it, it was really bad. I, I, I like slept for two days. Yeah. You deserve cold it. Just, yeah. Um, do you, do you make any sort of connections between having run the marathon and like trained for that and your creative career? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I so mean, that's obvious, I never thought right? I would be running a marathon ever. And I, uh, having done, I found that I am very competitive. Really? And, and <laughs> the only way that I could have run a marathon, like I wouldn't have been able to run 26 miles by myself. The fact that I'm running with a group of people and there's people cheering me on really mm -hmm. makes it easy. Um, yeah. And, and actually, with the proper training, it really was. I mean, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not doing you got a very through good it. job here. My brain. <laughs> That's okay. I just. Um, yeah, that was like a pop quiz question. <laughs> uh, pop quiz. My assumption was that it was like just getting up every day and continuing to like work at it, and then. Yeah, but I didn't do that. Being prepared. <laughs> but you here, did it? No. I mean... <laughs> here's my here's my a... thing is that I didn't really try for this marathon. It You I... don't think that you did? I mean, you just no. ran a fucking 26 mile marathon. Like And it wasn't hard. And you just said it wasn't hard. So clearly you did I... far more than I've done <clears throat> physically. Yeah, but I so you're supposed to be training like crazy. I yeah. I didn't train the last couple of weeks because I had the injuries. Yeah. So but what about like Daniel and JC? I mean, they trained they... like every day. Really? More yeah. than you think you did. Yeah. Interesting. And I still beat them. <laughs> wow. Yay. It's because you're competitive. Um, and yeah. I also think that my body is built for running long distance. Yeah, like, that's what I just... found out about the marathon um, is that my body definitely is built for running long distance. And if I actually applied myself and trained like a proper human does for a yeah. marathon, I could really do well. I got three hours and 40 minutes, which is yeah. really good for somebody that hasn't really um, had the opportunity of training the way that I should have because of my injuries. Um, like I had a broken hand, then I had that surgery for my polyps and um, so things have been, there's yeah. been a lot going on where it really yeah. took me out of being able to train. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I wish I liked running more because I feel like I could really be good at it. I mm -hmm. just don't like being alone like that for yeah. those, <laughs> like hours upon hours of just running Yeah. in the marathon. Like I didn't even really listen to music or, um, yeah, podcast. like you usually do. Like I yeah, usually do. Yeah, because there are just yeah. people everywhere and people cheering your name. And yeah, and the energy is amazing. Been really exciting. The I can't even describe to you what the energy is like. It's uh, y you feel love. Like everyone mm -hmm. is genuinely 
there to cheer you on and are, and are really enthusiastic. And people are yelling your name the whole way. And it's just, it's beautiful. It really is wow. an amazing experience. Yeah. Amazing. The, li- there's nothing else like it. Well, now that that's done, you're on to the next thing, which is scuba diving. <laughs> yeah. I started last night um, in the pool and I breathed underwater for the first time, which is kind of cool. So you're getting lessons to go to Belize. We don't have the tickets to Belize yet, but yeah. we think it's we think we're going to go to Belize, but we're not quite sure, sure yet. We're going to go yeah. somewhere. We just don't know where. Somewhere and scuba dive. Yeah. Amazing. Have you been scuba diving? Nope. Just snorkeling. See, I haven't even done snorkeling. <laughs> I'll stick with snorkeling. <laughs> Scuba's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of work, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. just, I was actually, uh, you have to complete five quizzes um, <laughs> as the, like an before, e-learning thing before the yeah. second class, which takes 10 hours. So, oh of course, I found God. a way to cheat. Yeah, I don't know. Just the whole like, yeah, the underwater breathing thing like freaks me out. And I don't know. It, you get used to it really quickly. It yeah. It feels weird, but then once you're sitting on the ground and you're like calm and you're seeing other other people around you breathing, mm-hmm. you're just like, okay. And then you you get your body just adjusts really quickly. It's kind mm-hmm. of amazing how quickly your body adjusts to these like mm. conditions. Yeah. So, uh-huh. what's going on with you? I know we had a couple of weeks off, so I had a, a family emergency. Um, that's all all you know good now yeah thank God. um so that was a bit crazy but um and and during that week um that that was going on i was like doing a phone interview for that big proposal that i worked on with a bunch of collaborators um and we were like waiting to hear back from that and it was just super like stressful with everything going on but um we did not get that project which sometimes after that happens it's kind of like you know if you feel, if you don't feel like sad about it, you kind of feel like, oh, well, it just wasn't meant to be. Um, and I think at a certain point in your career, if you're lucky, and I think it's also due to like my network of connections at this point, um, another opportunity always comes around the corner. Um, and so this one was, this is for an organization that the the RFP, the request for proposal specified experience working on LGBTQI issues. Um, So that was really cool. Yeah. So this would just be like, perfect. I'm waiting to hear more about it. But I, um, I actually like I realized I don't see the LGBTQI really used like the I as frequently and I kind of like actually forgot. It's what I. It it's also yeah. I A. I A. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but you know, again, like you're always talking about the the acronyms are getting too long. Yeah. And, um, but it's for intersex, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, My dog is intersex. Really? Yeah. I got him to. Uh, fizz gig. Yes, fizz gig. <laughs> I I took him to go get his to go get fixed and they were like oh once we cut him open there's a lot going on in there <laughs> it's not it looks as though he has components of both sex and i was like oh. okay so what do we do and they're like we just clipped what we thought we should clip <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, i hope everything works yeah. out <laughs> well i was it was also the back of a truck like parked by a park i got one of my <laughs> cats fixed in one of those too in south boston back like in the a day job. and the veterinarian was this really weird old dude with pink hair and like he was just really weird <laughs> like, <laughs> they're so sketchy so sketchy like um yeah so I mean, what is the project about um Can you i talk can't about really, it? no i can't really okay. re- reveal too much yeah but i will definitely keep you guys posted whether or not i get it and what the organization is all about so cool um that... have you done a lot of work with lgbtq uh no. th- that's random no, actually, that you would get that no. well it was from a connection who um basically it was for branding and web so the web the web developer that was a friend of a, another collaborator that, that i've worked with um connected us and said i you know i thought that you guys might want to like talk about this project and so um it's amazing how a project comes up uh right when you need it yes totally (laughs) 
<laughs> from the heavens. Yeah, it's so it, it's very random how that works. I I yep. just uh, I just lost or didn't get uh, the last yeah. three proposals that I put out. Really? Which once you hit three, you're sort of like, what am I doing here that needs to yeah. change? It's yeah, it's got to be me now, which is kind of disappointing. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely yeah with that big proposal and just I'm definitely looking forward to like thinking about some things business wise and the types of projects I want to like to really go after and sort of how what I need to do to like make that happen and what I need to cut back on to make that happen. And I am wanting to do a rebrand for my business and brand new website. It's so archaic. And just this year was just so busy. I haven't done any of that kind of work for myself. And I really think it would benefit um, my business in the long run. So yeah, same. I need a rebranding too. Yeah. It's just so hard to like find the time. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, so should we dive into queer news and culture? Sure. Okay. <laughs> We've got a uh, new Trump administration rule could hurt LGBTQ youth in foster care. Oh, that right. motherfucker. Yeah. So this uh, this was basically stating that um, if a religious institution that handles foster care, they have the right to exclude um, foster parents that happen to be LGBTQ. I think. Yeah. 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 Um, That's too fucking bad. It's also like, you know. <sighs> I don't know. I, there's so many children in foster care that I'm a huge proponent for that. And I yep. and I almost am like, you know, here's gay people. The, we have this opportunity. If you do want children, there's all of these children to yeah. foster, the, which is how I would do it if I were to have children. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. It's just that's also sad. It really is. Yeah. But so fuck that... the Trump administration. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Fuck him. He's been driving me crazy this, everyone crazy this week. It's just over the top. It's never ending. It's exhausting. Yeah. What else has been going on? The study shows LGBTQ characters are at high record on network TV, which uh, Brendan from season one, Glad, posted yeah. about on Twitter. I'm real. This is, I feel like this is true. I'm definitely seeing it everywhere even where i'm not expecting like i'll just be watching a show and then a character will pop up and i'm like yeah it um representation matters for sure yeah have you watched batwoman speaking of i have not watched it yet i haven't I... heard that great of uh feedback from it really i yeah. watched the first episode and i was like meh it's still uh... oh i thought that you liked it now i I like it because I'm a comic book person, so I yes. give I I like let a lot slide. <laughs> yeah, right. And you yeah, and you probably criticize it in a different way too, being a comic yeah. book person. Right. Um, um. But I'll watch anything that has to do with comic books. I'll go to the movies even if they get bad reviews. I mean, I'm I'm like a dork when it comes to that. Sort of thing. A total dork. Yeah. So. Um. But yeah, we'll link to that article on um, there's a couple articles actually about like lists of shows with the characters. Um, super exciting, I think. And um, yeah, I was watching I got into this show atypical, atypical on Netflix, which is about a teenager with autism. And um, it's a great show. It's so well written. And the yeah, basically, it's a brother and sister in um in high school, actually, he's 18 and it shows like his therapy sessions and um, the, you know, all the characters have their own um, storyline and the daughter basically between seasons one and three or dumps her boyfriend and gets a girlfriend and um, they draw that out for like three seasons. <laughs> it's like you, you saw, you saw something between the, her and her best friend in high school in like season one. And you're like, Oh, is there something there? And then by like season three, it finally comes out. Who's um, the lead actor in that? Um, I forget his name. Sam. Yeah, he's so great. Um, he's like a, a super fan for Bravo TV. Really? Yeah, he loves um, all the housewives. Oh my God, his name is Keir Gilchrist. Oh, Keir, that's not who I'm thinking of. Keir Gilchrist plays Sam Gardner, an 18-year-old boy on the autism spectrum. Oh no, um, I was talking about his dad. You're thinking of, oh, his dad, yeah. It's, um. I'm going to read you the list of um actors in it now. 
actually, because it is um, Jennifer Jason Lee plays the mother. So She's great. great. And then Michael Rappaport is who you're Michael thinking Rappaport, of. Michael Rappaport, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, a, he's always on Watch What Happens Live. Oh, he yeah. He loves the housewives. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, and then Bridget Lundy Payne um, plays the daughter who gets a girlfriend and she um, she is actually queer in real life. She's 25 and um, she's talked about um, being queer. Cool. Yeah. What do you think about the queer people playing queer roles? Do, are you a stickler for that? Like, there's an argument for, let's say, a trans character being played by a trans actor. Yeah, and it's funny you ask that because last night I texted you. I was watching. Um, I sound like I watch like a lot of TV, but actually, I am really busy in my real life, and this is how I <laughs> unwind. Um, I watch I a lot of TV. Yeah, I feel like, but I am. Um, it's also partially research for our podcast, right? But I was mm. watching Beautiful Darling, which is um a documentary about Candy Darling, who is a transgender pioneer, who was one of Andy Warhol's like, you know, it girls. And she was really beautiful and fascinating and died at 29. But um, so anyway, that was the documentary, but apparently there was a movie also done about it that I'm going to check out where um, Chloe Sevigny played her. And I was kind of like, Chloe Sevigny. Yeah. Chloe Sevigny is cool, but like she has plenty of other work. Like why can't they, give this role to a trans person yeah. i kind of felt that way so i don't know it's like i kind of i think actors should be able to play should be able to act right like that's a beautiful part about that art but when it's like underrepresented people and like marginalized people like what was that movie where there was like a white person playing like a was native american or something like some like disney movie or something yeah. i don't know like Scarlett Johansson. She's yeah. been accused of that like three times. Yeah. Like I do think there are plenty of people and underrepresented people t and underemployed, uh, you know, actors um, in different like groups that could be could could do the part. So <laughs> what about what like think? a gay man, like a white? What about a white gay man who we Such have an seen? Interesting question. Which yeah. We have seen on TV quite yeah. a few times. Right. Um so would yeah. you are you the type of person that believes that that should be played by a white gay actor? No, I, I'm not. I'm no. not a trans. I can see the argument. Yeah. And I'm a little bit um, I'm, I'm more of a, 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 a inclined to agree with um, the activist who who prefer prefer trans people playing trans roles. Yeah. But for gay and lesbian, especially white gay and lesbian which we have seen we haven't seen a not a, enough of but we have yeah. seen we have seen them so for that i feel like i would be okay with um I totally then it's like making rules for some people and not all people so then it gets murky <clears throat> yeah i know I yeah know. super interesting i'm glad that i don't i'm not i'm not making those rules <laughs> yeah <laughs> should we go on to introduce hugh yeah, I'm so excited for this yeah. interview. Yeah, me too. Hugh Ryan was, you had been following his, his work when Brooklyn was queer, his new book. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, when Brooklyn was queer, um, Darren was reading this and I was like, give me that book. What is this? And I, oh. I started reading it. And then when I, I, I went into the decal market close to my house um, mm -hmm. where, I, where I moved from and there was an art display up and I was like, oh, and I saw Hugh Ryan and it was like imagery from the late 1800s um, yeah. from this book. And it was like sort of an art project. So anyway, I reached out to Hugh, um, who was thrilled to come on to the podcast and talk with us. Um, very generous with his time. Um I love the book. I, I couldn't put it down. It was it's a great look into queer history f focused specifically on Brooklyn um, between like 1850 uh, uh, up. So um, it's a great read. I recommend everyone going out to pick it up. I'm, yeah, I was excited. I could have talked to him for hours. Um, yeah, yeah, really. A round of applause for our just amazing and like 
intelligent. Oh, there he is well, behind you. Well, well spoken guests this season. Yeah. 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 What does his shirt um, say? Queens against fascism. Love it. Yeah. So yeah, here's the cover. Um, yeah. So he he talks about the early days um, of Walt Whitman in the 1850s. Um, Up to like Navy World Yard. War II in the Brooklyn yeah. Navy Yard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Guardian called it a funny, tender, and disturbing history of LGBTQ life. Was there something you found disturbing about the book in like a cool way? Um, well, to see sort of the night, to get a glimpse of sort of how the nightlife is um, oh. back then, it does get a little uh, seedy, I guess. But yeah, I don't know if disturbing. I mean, yeah, I guess yeah, that's, what, that's I mean, apparently what they said. Um. <laughs> I mean, it's a great book. We definitely recommend everyone going out to get a copy. Um, we'll be promoting this book for the two weeks that this episode is going to be up. And um, we're also going to be g- doing a giveaway, um, which yeah. the day that this episode launches, which is this Wednesday, I think the 13th, will be um, – But we haven't decided the details yet, but we'll post it on social media where we'll be giving away a copy of the book to one of our yeah. listeners. Jonah will figure that out for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I um, I thought it was – just really great and inspiring how he kind of talked about like he didn't see anything documented about the history of queer Brooklyn and he didn't he didn't find any so he started doing like his own research and going into like his, the you know the lesbian history historical society for instance and asking around and asking questions and inquiring about it and then sort of collecting that information just kind of organically and then applying for a grant to like actually do this research in a more focused way and um i think that's definitely definitely inspiring yeah and he talks about that a little bit in the interview too Mm -hmm. so if somebody's out there interested in grant opportunities um yeah he sort of touches upon that and gives you Mm -hmm. an idea of how to explore that Yep. Yeah, um, he talks about some really interesting opportunities, actually. Um, I can take you to the lesbian um, historical. I would love that. Like we should definitely do that. Mm-hmm. It's great. We'll, we'll go. Um, yeah. But he was great, too. I loved I wish we could have pressed him a little bit more. Um, I, I wanted to focus on the book and not get into his personal yeah. life too much. But um, he, when he dropped the fact that he was in a throuple, I was like, Oh, that's another episode. Po- poly, poly <laughs> is the more PC term. Jonah. Oh, is it a poly? Sorry, <laughs> a poly. <laughs> <clears throat> he said poly. throuple. Well, actually, he said he was yeah, the throuple he... whisperer. <laughs> oh, did? Oh, okay. Yeah, wow, did. I don't remember that. But yeah, super, super. He's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um. So check out the book when Brooklyn was queer, and um, check out the interview to hear more about it and Hugh Ryan. With Hugh Ryan, yes. Enjoy. Wish I had my motherfucking Henny right now, man. No shit. It made bitch. This Brooklyn bitch. This red like bitch. Huh? All right. So today we're talking to Hugh Ryan, who is a writer, curator, and speaker in New York City. His work is about queer politics, culture, and history. And his brand new book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, is a groundbreaking exploration of the LGBTQ history of Brooklyn from the early days of Walt Whitman in the 1850s up through the women who worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard during World War II and beyond. No other book, movie, or exhibition has ever told this specific story. We're so excited to talk to you today, Hugh. Welcome. Yes, hey. welcome, Hugh. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So we want to jump right in to the book today. That's yes. why you're here, and that's Let's what you've been it. busy with. So The Guardian called When Brooklyn Was Queer a funny, tender, and disturbing history of LGBTQ life. Um, tell us the story behind writing this book on queer history in Brooklyn from 150 years ago. What inspired it? It's actually kind of a funny story. I moved to New York in 2002 and I worked with queer youth, uh, queer street involved youth. And I had a degree in women's studies. I had studied queer history. Mm-hmm. My family was from the Bronx. Like I thought I knew New York's queer history. And then I had been in New York for maybe about eight years 
nine years. It was uh, 2010, end of 2010. And I was doing a show, an exhibition on the queer history of um, just sort of general queer history. And in the course of doing that, uh, someone started to ask about the queer history of Brooklyn, and I started thinking about curating a specific queer history of Brooklyn show. And I was like, oh, this will be so exciting. And I'd worked on a lot of local queer history shows before. And in Philly, people were super excited to talk about queer Philly history. And in Illinois, people were super excited to talk about queer Illinois history. But I put out a call for exhibitions in Brooklyn and nobody knew anything. <laughs> it was almost shocking. Like I thought, oh, okay, I'll go get a book and I'll put together a little primer and then people will build exhibits off of that. But there was no book. And then I was like, well, there's got to be like a documentary or like a website or a Tumblr or a live journal from <laughs> 2004, you know, something devoted to the queer history of Brooklyn. And there just wasn't. And I, I was just so surprised that I started not even knowing I was writing a book. I just was like, well, let me, in the course of doing journalism and curating shows, anytime I would talk to someone, I'd be like, can, can you tell me anything about the queer history of Brooklyn? Or does what you're doing connect to Brooklyn in any way? And just collected little bits of information. Uh, and after about five years of doing that, I had a moment wow. where I was like, oh, I this think is I'm writing a, a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing how it works out like that. Yeah, it just kind of came together pretty magically. It's a great book. I I um, finished it a couple of months ago when we initially talked, and um, now read uh, Now I'm listening to it on Audacity. That wow. was really fun doing the audiobook. I hope you're enjoying it because I, I was insistent. I was like, no, I want to read my own book, and everyone yes. was like, mm, maybe. <laughs> so why were they so hesitant? Yeah, that's so weird. I don't know. I, I listen to some audiobooks, but not a ton. And I've noticed that there are definitely ones where the author kills it. Like they read the whole thing in a monotone. You know, they're oh, like, oh, sure. Yeah. This is the history of Brooklyn. <laughs> and you're like, Split do you even wrist. know what words sound like? Like, are you a human being? Uh, so I think there was a little bit of that. There was some dubiousness. Um, but I just found out that I've been nominated for a voice actor award for reading the book. Wow. So. Congratulations. I feel pretty that, good. So <laughs> that could be another career path. I mean, like you could freelance oh, doing course. that. Don't get my dreams up. I would <laughs> so love that. I love audiobooks. I love the narration and doing the recording was super fun. So maybe someday. That's you did a really awesome. good job. Thank you. Our producer, uh, JC, is also listening to it in Audacity right now. Or he just finished, and uh, he commented on, on your voice, and actually, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I always had a fantasy of doing, like, an animated character. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That would You'd be, be so that. fun. <laughs> yeah, so much fun. So I just want to back up for a minute. So you couldn't find, you said, some other cities that you had a, had a you know, canon or mm -hmm. um, libraries of queer history documented, but not Brooklyn. But what about New York as a whole? as a whole. And I don't want to like derail us too much, mm -hmm. but that sort of came to mind as you were talking. Yeah. New York as a whole, there's some great books. I mean, the one that I owe such a, a, a debt to in my own work is George Chauncey's Gay New York, which is kind okay. of the like standard tome. Uh, the second volume is actually going to come out pretty soon. And it's an incredible history. Not only does it document everything happening in New York, but he really worked out a lot of the sort of larger sociological trends for queer in America and the examples come from New York but really I, I really depended on his book and then uh, Joan Nessel who's the founder of the Lesbian Herstory Archives yeah. she was tremendously helpful um, I talked to her I've read all of her writings she really was a great guide and then there's a whole other group of books uh, Charles Kaiser's The Gay Metropolis um, I'm trying to think of uh, gay new uh, gay American history by Jonathan Ned Katz, which doesn't focus on New York City, but he's mm -hmm. a New Yorker and so he knows a ton. Uh, and then there were tons of books that were smaller, more academic, much more focused. Like there's one called Interzones, uh, which is about the queer history. I think it's called like Black and White Sex Districts in New York City and Chicago at the turn of the century. <laughs> you know, so it's very oh. specific. Yeah. Wow. How is that book? <laughs> 
really good. Actually, that sounds like, like it's something right at my alley. Yeah, it's really great and helped me to truly understand the history of Harlem, which I have always thought of as a place that was known as a nightlife destination and a black neighborhood and also a queer neighborhood. But he really writes that a lot of that doesn't come about until the 1920s, you know, post Great Migration. And that was really eye opening for me. Uh, so I highly recommend that book. Yeah, and I know Kevin the history Mumford. somewhat of Harlem um, being very. Um, I know that there's a lot of written history on the lesbianism and um, of lesbians rather in, lesbianism uh, lesbians <laughs> in Harlem. But that's about as far as my my history goes there. What mm -hmm. about the title of the book? Mm -hmm. The title queer. Of the, book the word was queer is like. Uh, having a moment right now it is and i'm a big fan of it because i like that it doesn't call to mind a specific type of person that you know mm -hmm. like lesbian or transgender might and particularly as you go back into the victorian era a lot of the words we use now just aren't applicable to how people thought back then so i wanted to avoid anything too specific the one thing i don't like about the title is that it makes people think that I'm sort of saying that Brooklyn isn't queer now or right. And what I like to say is that Brooklyn is queerer than it has ever been, obviously, and in a more powerful, more visible, more diverse queerness. But the, during the period I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, certainly Brooklyn was not a place you thought of when you thought about queer experiences. It was a place people came from, not a place mm -hmm. people went to. And that when you went back, particularly into the 1920s and 30s, there was a time where people came to Brooklyn looking for queer experiences the same way that we might go to Chelsea or Greenwich Village or, you know, Bushwick now. Uh, but that that just was not something that I had ever grown up with and never anything people talked about in general histories of Brooklyn. And so that was how I kind of landed on the title. Great. Yeah. Brooklyn's having a bit of a resurgence now, too, where it, it is becoming a queer destination. Um, oh, absolutely. It's an incredible. I feel like uh, every day I'm told there's a new gay bar somewhere <laughs> or a bar with a gay night or a coffee shop that's also a gay bar and also a lending library and a co-working space and an art gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fabulous. Yeah, it's really great. And I, I live in Bed-Stuy now. I, I lived most of the time I've been in New York in various parts of Brooklyn, though I did decamp briefly for Washington Heights. But I felt bad oh. the whole time. <laughs> well, did you say her name was Leslie at the uh, Lesbian Herstory Archive? Uh, Joan, Joan Nessel. Joan Nessel. Leslie. That would be too obvious. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> I had uh, the, our producer, JC, and I, we were really fascinated by the, um, during the height of the AIDS epidemic, of the, we, we, we read a couple of articles about how lesbians were really going out of the way to take care of men that were dying of AIDS during that time. And I, that just, really hit me hard mm. uh and i sort of wanted to dive into that so i actually visited the um history museum here or history archives rather um over here but i didn't get a chance to meet her um that's a is it still existing is it yep. still in a brownstone yep still in, in brownstone in park wow. Slope. yep i should it's stop a... by again maybe next yeah. time you're in the town we should check it out yeah and i feel like that project is still has is promising to like keep looking into yeah, for sure. Especially since like, what I really find interesting about it is um, gay and lesbians, in the 90s, at least you, you had a lesbian bar, oh, and you had yeah, a gay even bar. Even before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. So during for lesbians to sort of, you know, take care of these men that were dying, it just yeah. it really moved me. Um, There's actually an incredible uh, oral history at the Brooklyn Historical Society that's like a collection of oral histories about AIDS in Brooklyn done, I think, in the early 90s. Oh, wow. And some of them get into that. Cool. I'll have to check it mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So actually, like, while we're on there, can you talk a little bit about, well, first tell us about the process of, of writing the book. Like, how did you find these records how did you dig for in information about like erased overlooked stories and people and the nice thing was that because i didn't know i was writing a book at first there was a long period of time <laughs> where i could just sort of ask questions and chase down rumors and buy used books off of you know random websites selling 
you know, books that were published by tiny presses in 1932, you know? And I would just collect all of these things uh, and just put them in on a timeline so that I could say to myself, okay, well, I can look at trends. I can sort of see what's out there. And so for it was while it was a very organic process, I just asked everyone, what would you say I should look at? What do you know? Who else should I talk to? That was a question in every mm -hmm. interview I did. Who else will be able to tell me more? And then I just kept doing that. And thankfully, uh, about five years into that process, I got a grant from the New York Public Library to do research in their collection because they have one of the best collections of queer materials in the world. Wow. And they gave me three months uh, to take a sabbatical from my day job. And they said to me when I sat down that the first day, they were like, you know, by the time you're done here, you should have your book proposal done. And that's when I was like, oh. I'm writing a book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so then I got really much more focused about it. But by that point, I had this kind of structure. Like I knew that I was looking at the waterfront in particular for much of this history. I knew that there were certain kinds of jobs that kept coming up over and over again in my research. Sailors, sex workers, factory girls, artists, entertainers. And so those categories gave me a way to shape the research after that. And then yeah. uh, as I went on, I started giving pieces of it to uh, experts in the field, historians, writers, uh, queer elders, and just saying, could you look at this? Are there things I'm missing? Am I talking about this the right way? What else would you recommend? Uh, so it really was a very organic community supported process. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to hear. You really do create this um, while reading the book. It's very visual. You have a very unique way of making this sort of creating like a it's almost like a cinematic it's it's very it's very visual it's it's you can close your eyes and, and feel like you're there thank you that was really important to me i wanted not only for people to kind of get the facts but to get the feel you know it had to be emotional for me and to do that i had to embed all the information in characters i think of my book as being a giant collection of narrators who lead you through important moments in time and so then that gives me the ability to flesh them out like once they're people i could find photographs of them and descriptions of them and sometimes even their own words and that allowed me to make it visual you had now a person whose experiences you could see whose body you could see and they could tell you what was happening because i love history i i truly do and i I read a lot of really boring shit and I was like I want this if it's gonna be the only book out there about Brooklyn's queer history I want it to speak to a really wide range of people and I think you can't bore them yeah 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 and actually Jonah you um, commented on loving seeing you um, post little tidbits on Twitter of like oh, little yeah. little like stories specific stories you posted um, one today. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, was a new research. It was interesting. It, I, I, I can't remember. It was a was it a lesbian stripper that went. Yes. Stealth. Went deep stealth <laughs> in the 1950s. Uh, she had been a like kind of butch stripper. And as she put it, arch man hater. <laughs> and then a year and a half later, she was married with a stepdaughter mm -hmm. living in suburban Chicago. With a man. Uh, with a man, yep. Who knew her history. She changed her name. Oh. She changed everything. Uh, I, I'm currently working on a book about the queer history of a prison in New York City, the Women's House of Detention that used to be in Greenwich Village. Wow. And, and that is incredible. I mean, it, it's amazing to think that in the heart of Greenwich Village, there was a prison from like the 1930s up to the 1970s. And, and in fact, Greenwich wow. Village had been home to prisons in New York City going back like hundreds of years. But this particular women's prison was there for those 40 years. And the records of the women who were incarcerated there are incredible. It's one of the, strangely, one of the best archives I've ever found outside of the Lesbian History Archives for lesbian history. Wow, is it a lot of personal records, like uh, letters or? The records that I'm looking at in particular right now are social workers who worked with formerly incarcerated <laughs> women. That must be good. And so they do have letters from these people. They have photos wow. of them. Uh, not for every file, but some of these women were involved with the organization I'm working with or looking at for 35 years. And so they follow them every year what's happening with them where they're living what kind of job do they have what relationships do they have so it's a real uh, robust body of information are any of the people still alive 
They yeah. are. I have one that I've interviewed already and two that I'm hoping to interview eventually. It sounds like a great book. I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to write it. It's uh... (laughs) take a little while. The hot gossip sounds great. Hot (laughs) goss. Yeah, I have all the great gossip from like 1927. Uh, That's that's so juicy. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about, or tell our listeners a little bit about the kinds of people that you that are featured in when Brooklyn was queer? The different kinds of people. Yeah, like you have some really developed characters in this book it's a pretty wide range i wanted to kind of show um a a broad idea of lgbtq plus identities Uh, and going back historically some of them are people who may not have even considered themselves queer in any ways or they may have considered themselves in very different ways from us so for instance one of the uh, people that i really love in the book is a sex worker named loop the loop I love Loop Loop. Mm-hmm. Uh, she took her name from the Coney Island roller coaster, which was one of the first to turn its ro- <laughs> riders completely upside down. She's great. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. She's really incredible. And she's a, a trans woman who we only know through interviews with this doctor who was a really sort of homophobic, racist, uh, he's a real terrible person. Uh, but he did contain a, or, or take down a lot of information about Loop, which was really incredibly wow. helpful. And we were able to learn, you know, that she was a street walking uh, sex worker. So she didn't work in a brothel. She was actually in a certain area of her neighborhood in Brooklyn with a number of other trans women. She said she had never been arrested, that uh, her clients had no problem with, you know, the hair on her arm, which the doctor asked her about at one point. Uh, and then all of these interesting things happen in the interactions between them. You know, she tells the doctor that she was pregnant at one point. And it's interesting because at the time, folks who we might today think of as transgender thought of themselves as this category, uh, either a fairy or an invert, which kind of combines and collapses our ideas of being transgender, being homosexual, and being intersex. So it mm-hmm. is possible that she thought she had been pregnant at one point. But again, we only have this sort of one interaction. And she's obviously a person who knows a lot about sex. Uh, And she's also kind of making fun of the doctor at certain points, it feels like. So she may well have been trying to play a joke on this doctor and convince him, oh, my God, you know, like he thinks that I might actually have been pregnant. (laughs) Or she might have been doing what trans women still do today, which is try and convince doctors that they are, quote unquote, real women so that they will get the respect that they deserve. And I think that there's Mm -hmm. an argument to be made that she was doing that. You know, a lot of these characters are fascinating but they're also distant from us and so we're left with partial records that we try to figure out okay who is this person um before loop there's this really wonderful character who i only have a few mentions of because it was so hard to find any real information about her but florence hines was one of the most famous drag kings of the victorian era Mm -hmm. because drag was huge in the late 1800s and she was a black woman who performed with these incredibly important shows that were some of the uh really earliest to showcase black entertainers as artists not just as you know um you know people just sort of doing what came naturally but instead saying no she is a black woman who is an artist as a singer a dancer and a drag king and she performed down at coney island so she was another one of those characters that just i fell in love with as i read tiny bits about her life collected in mostly black newspapers from around the country Uh, newspapers were an incredible uh archive for my research i just returned to different newspapers over and over again so she was a traveling act yeah. And, and what year was this? Uh, she was traveling in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. 1904, she stopped performing entirely. And it's a little hard to work out exactly why. Some people say that she was injured at that point and retired from the stage. Some people said that she actually continued acting, but sort of changed her um, role and eventually became a preacher when Prohibition came in. As a um, man. No, no, as a woman, uh, apparently. It's, again, hard to know. She, uh, often in researching the people of color in the book, the records are just so much skimpier than when you're doing Mm -hmm. research on white people. Uh, The major white newspapers didn't often do big profiles on black performers the same way they did on white performers. The black newspapers uh, did, but they're collected less frequently. So, Mm -hmm. for instance, 
there used to be a black neighborhood in Brooklyn called Weeksville in the 1800s. We know that there were two different newspapers that were active in Weeksville, but only one issue of one has ever been found. So not only are we dealing with a situation where there was less information collected about these people at the time, but then historically less has been saved. Preserved, yeah. 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 Can you talk about the the race relations there, especially within the queer community and sort mm -hmm. of the hierarchy? Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I was not anticipating when I started this research, because I didn't know a ton about Brooklyn, was how white Brooklyn was historically. From the end of slavery up through like the 1940s, Brooklyn was always 98, 99% white. It was whiter than Manhattan. Uh, it was more racist than most of the state, uh, which is you know hard to quantify. But in the like 1870s, there was a statewide vote in New York to grant uh, universal um, voting rights to black men, so you wouldn't have to own property in order to vote. And it fails in the state with like it gets like 36 percent of the vote, but in Brooklyn it gets something like. 18% of the vote, right? So we know that Brooklyn was a whiter space. It was in many ways a more racist space, that there were uh, black neighborhoods and eventually um, small areas that were Filipino, that were Arab, uh, that were uh, Asian immigrants, although they, um, other Asian immigrants, so they tend to come later than the kind of the, the scope of my book. Um, but a, a lot of these areas were kept white on purpose. So uh, people of color were kept from living there. They were kept from working there. And they were kept from socializing in those bars. And so we know from the very beginning, the queer community in Brooklyn was stratified by race and gender. Uh, it's not until around uh, the 1880s, 1890s that I was able to find a queer person of color who was well-documented, who lived in Brooklyn. And that was the author, uh, Alice Ruth Moore Dunbar Nelson. She actually lived in Brooklyn Heights uh, right after she published her first book and she lived there for a couple of years. So she was kind of a, a really important point in my, my research. And then once you start to get into the later years, into the 1900s, you start to see a rise, particularly in the black population, in New York City as a whole. And then because the subway in the 1900s becomes really important, you get these kind of archipelago situations where a woman like Mabel Hampton, who's a black lesbian dancer and domestic worker in, in the 1920s, she would live in Harlem or live in Jersey City, mm -hmm. go out in Greenwich Village in Harlem, and then work in Coney Island. And so mm -hmm. you get people who were sort of moving between these areas where it was possible to live as a person of color in New York and work working in other areas where it was possible to work as a person of color, but the kind of long uh, flyover areas of the subway in between, maybe she didn't go to very often at all because of the racism um, and also the parochialism. New York, when you go back into the 1800s and the early 1900s, is really divided by ethnicity as well as by race. So if you were Irish, there were certain neighborhoods you might live in. Um, my parents always tell the story that they grew up in a very Irish neighborhood in the Bronx. And then when they would go to the beach, they would all go to a beach on the Rockaways that was all Irish. So that at noon, when everyone did the Angelus, they would all stand together and then they would all kneel together. And that was in the wow. 1950s. So imagine yeah. how stratified things were in 1900 or 1880. Right. Mm -hmm. What about like Jewish Brooklyn? Do you go into that at all? Like. A little bit. Jewish. Yeah. So what's interesting about uh, Jewish Brooklyn and German Brooklyn is that mm -hmm. those immigrant groups tended to come over in um, much more uh, gender balanced numbers. They tended to mm. immigrate not as lots of single men looking for work or mm. single women being driven out by hunger. That's the situation you get in Ireland, but rather whole family and even whole community units coming together. Uh, in the case of Eastern European Jews, often this was because they were being forced out by pogroms and they would come in numbers that were more gender unified. So you had more outlets for what was called, you know, correct sexual practices so mm -hmm. you see less queer sexual practice and less recorded queer sexual practices and because they tended to be moving with people who knew them already or into neighborhoods where people knew them already again queer history gets hidden it gets repressed right. a little bit more so the area of the waterfront up by williamsburg had comparatively less queer history although not none but less than the lower uh, southern brooklyn areas where you have more of the irish and 
Italian immigrants. But by the 1930s, the Great Depression, you look at, say, Brooklyn College, and that becomes a really important area for activists, for queer people, for labor unionists, and for uh, Jews in Brooklyn. And a lot of the queer Jewish history that I found that I was really able to go into revolves around people connected to Brooklyn College. Mm. We, th- could, we could just jump back really quick. Um, I was really fascinated by some of the characters, like Luke de Loop, for instance, mm-hmm. who really seemed to be living out loud, right? And um, it didn't come off as hidden, or um, it seemed almost socially acceptable. Can you just touch upon that and sort of like, you know, um, we had this big movement in the 90s where we sort of have this recognition now, right? Um, but there's this huge time period where you know, we had um, where queer erasure sort of happened mm-hmm. and we were sort of pushed down and out of society. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, you know, post-World War II is really when this kind of major homophobia, which I was taught was all of history, comes Same. into play. So that's mm-hmm. like 1945 up through, you know, the start of the AIDS crisis or maybe the 70s. That, that's the real like peak homophobia in America, I, I think. And before that, you have a... It's just very different. The few people who I've been able to uh, read interviews with who were alive in the 30s, 40s, 50s, all say things like, you know, before the war, you had a lot of ignorance. You didn't have a lot of spaces that were particularly for lesbians or for gay men. But you also didn't have the same kind of homophobia where someone might get beaten up on the streets just for being gay. So there definitely was homophobia before that. Uh, It was just different in the way that it operated. It wasn't as powerful. And in part, that's because the main idea of queerness going back historically is based on gender, right? And Mm -hmm. so the people who were really recognized as being queer were folks whose gender presentations were really off. And that was thought to be uh, like the way we talk about, you know, born this way. They were thought to be born this way. Their bodies were different. Their brains were different. They were almost a third sex, an invert, an inverted sex. And those people were often pitied. Uh, They were looked down upon. They also had a role, though, in society, particularly as performers. That was one place Mm -hmm. you would see a lot of these people. Uh, And in working class areas where there was no expectation of privacy, where you kind of couldn't hide who you were, they had a role in working class communities. So we actually see going back historically that in working class communities, some, not all, and again, not every individual, you have a place for people who are really gender nonconforming. Uh, That place might have been as a sex worker, it might have been somewhat as an outcast, but it also was recognized and there was room for you to exist. When that starts to change in the early 1900s, when we really start to get this understanding that sexuality is separate from gender and that it's not about your body, it's about your mind, that's when homophobia becomes the really powerful force that it is. It's a number of reasons that this happens, uh, partially relating to you know Joseph McCarthy and the Lavender Scare and the Red Scare, the hunt for communists, all of that, partially related to the army and the navy and the military in general and their uh, real crackdown on homosexuality. But I think the big kind of focal point is that If queerness revolves around the body, you can tell when most people are queer. They look Mm -hmm. wrong, they act wrong. If it's in your mind, if it's in your head, then queer people are like communists. We're invisible. We could be anywhere. Your best friend could be queer. You have to keep a watch on it. And you yourself could also be queer. So you have to make sure everyone knows you're not by Mm -hmm. actively performing your heterosexuality vocally, aggressively. And so that shift, wise, yeah. yeah, yeah, you could no longer, you know, there was a pansy craze in the 1920s. It was really considered <laughs> chic to go to a bar in Greenwich Village where you'd have a campy effeminate waiter or to have a character like that in your movie. But by mm-hmm. the 1940s, if you were a man seen in that bar or you were a man going to that movie or you were a man having sex with one of those men, suddenly it mean, meant something very different. Now it started to mean you were different as opposed to before where if you acted like a normal, quote unquote, respectable man, then no matter what you did, you were a little bit insulated from this idea that you might be queer. Right. So interesting. Mm-hmm. 
Do you have any thoughts? I mean, you're, you know, hyper focused on Brooklyn, but also it sounds like general awareness of the state um, and the world um, during that time. Do you have any thoughts on how the American perception deviated from the rest of the world oh, during yeah. this time of sexuality? Yeah. I will say that, you know, the rest of the world is not my, my Ballywick generally. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to make too you big, need broad to do statements. do some more research about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will say that in Europe, the model of sexology that we had in America kind of took hold a little bit sooner. You know, Freud, who is a big part of this shift from the body to the mind in terms of sexuality, mm -hmm. obviously is operative in uh, Germany first, yeah. Vienna, and a lot of the early sexologists are coming from Germany, from Vienna, from England, and so there's sort of a, a similar relationship um, in Europe as in America towards sexuality, although maybe it's a little bit earlier in Europe, uh, it takes a little bit longer to spread in the US. Also, it's very um, connected to the eugenics movement. Mm -hmm. And in America, the eugenics movement was much more about black and white relations. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot more of this kind of anti-black racism in eugenics and therefore in sexology in America, whereas in Europe, you were more likely to find a lot of anti-Semitic eugenic um, policies, although you also had racism and all of that. So those are some ways in which I would say it was really, really different. Um, as for you know the situation in, throughout Asia, um, Russia, South America, uh, Africa, Australia, I like know very very little. I mean, if you want to talk about like queerness in Middle East in the eighth century, I've done a lot of research there. But in the intervening oh, okay. thousand years, sure. I don't have a lot to give you. <laughs> <laughs> Has this book changed your um, perception uh, of sexual identity in any way? You know, I think that it has definitely furthered this sense that I have had for a long time that while our ideas about sexuality make sense in a certain way, they're kind of a holistic uh, theory, they are not natural or organic. Uh, they change over time and that there are always people who are not going to fit with the schema that we've come up with mm -hmm. and that that schema is always going to be changing and evolving and disrupted and that's actually what's really exciting for me because yeah. i came to queer history i think like a lot of folks because i didn't see myself in the world and i wanted to see a reflection of myself i wanted a mirror and then when i actually got into the research i was like oh there's not a mirror here there's a window and if I can see past my own reflection, I can see something much more interesting, which is the possibility of something completely different from me. Because if something incredibly different existed 100 years ago, that means that 100 years from now, things could be entirely yeah. different. And that's so freeing yeah. and so empowering. And so that's what I really came away from this research, thinking more and more about. There's a big movement right now, at least I think there is, where we're having a lot of um, glimpses into queer history. Um, do you know Robert Feisler? Mm -hmm. Who wrote yeah. Tinderbox. Tinderbox, we yeah. interviewed him. Oh, great. Um, which is also an another great book. Um, but do yeah. you, are you, I, I think it's very, a very exciting time. I think um, we're finally getting, I mean, when I was growing up, I, I knew Stonewall and mm -hmm. it's the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, right? So. Um, a lot of people have this, and I did when I was younger, where a gay liberation movement sort of began at mm -hmm. Stonewall. Um, and I love getting this book. It was so important to me when I was reading it. I was moved to tears quite a few times. Just trying to think of, um, had I known as a young queer person mm -hmm. that there was all of this other history, or just even that there were queer people. Yeah. For some reason, I think in my brain, I had convinced myself that we were some sort of mutant that just popped up in the mm -hmm. 70s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, with good reason. I don't think you convinced yourself of that. I think everything around you convinced you of that yeah. because certainly that's what my schools taught me. Yeah. That's what movies showed me. That's what history books told me. And I we mean, didn't have the access to information then when we were growing up. That we exactly. I mean, yeah. I learned about Walt Whitman in high school, but I certainly didn't learn that he was gay. And uh, whatever interpretation we gave to his poems had no relation to what they were actually about. You know, right. it was like this neutered version. Uh, and so it's, yeah, I, I think we all came with that idea and it's, it's changing now, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Robert Fiesler, we, we talked to him about, you know, obviously a lot of his research, that was a, a very specific uh, incident that happened with the fire and mm -hmm. um, a lot of, 
sad, dev- devastating stories. Um, I mean, I'm sure you encountered some in your in your research. Um, what's your mental state? Have you sought out therapy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He had to there, go through trauma therapy. Yeah. There were a lot of moments where I was like, Ooh, this is rough. You know, this is this is hard to read. But I think because I did have this structure that I wasn't just researching it, that it was I was I was going to give it to the world. Even the hardest things, um, it was exciting still to read them. It, it was evidence driven. of existence. Yeah. I think the the one thing uh, that still makes me sad is how many of these people at some point in their lives burned all of their letters or destroyed their diaries or their parents did it or, you know, that they were so they were able to live their lives. But the idea of leaving a record of it behind was what scared them. That's yeah, the so sad. Out. I remember being very young and writing um, love letters to my pretend male lover, yeah. <laughs> and then and that in writing them and like pouring my heart into them, right, mm. and then and then ripping them up immediately after so nobody could read. Which now that I'm saying out loud sounds really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but you were um, in good company historically. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Were you with your boyfriend during the, um, the writing of the book? Yes. Yeah. You were. Yeah. How long have you been together? Uh, I'm actually, I have two partners, and the three of us have been together for nine and a half years now. And they were together for wow. 10 years before we met. So they've been wow. together for 20 years. Oh, uh, there's so a plot twist. They, <laughs> they had to listen to all of this book uh, as I found it piece by piece. So yeah, sure. They've not only read it, but they've been inundated with it by this point. <laughs> so do you, do you consider yourself like, poly polyamorous yeah yeah Can i often joke that, I'm, that i'm the thruple whisperer because for years <laughs> there just weren't a lot of us out there and so you know i do like an event and then afterwards someone would email me and be like i really love that event by the way i have two partners i don't know what to do can i ask you some questions <laughs> Uh, which is really fun. It felt like being gay in the 90s again. You know, yeah. like it was that same exact reaction. People sort of like give you an eye and you're like, oh, I know what you're thinking. You have <laughs> wow. two girlfriends and you want to talk later. Uh, so that is always really fun. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very lucky. My parents have been wonderful about it. My family uh, knows the boys. That's how I refer to them. Mm-hmm. Tim and Jason. Uh, and it's been really great. That's oh. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then you went to school for women's studies. I find that really interesting. I definitely haven't met many men. I am actually technically the only person to graduate from Cornell as a man with a women's studies degree because the year after I graduated, they changed the name of the department. So now it's feminist gender and sexuality studies. Yeah. So I I like that. I like knowing that I'm like the only guy with a women's studies degree, unless there's someone who graduated and then transitioned after, which is totally possible. Do you see a clear path connection from anything, any research that you focused on for um, in college to to the to the when Brooklyn was queer to your current work? I did a lot of studying on um, sort of critical theory around race, gender, and sexuality. Mm-hmm. So uh, this was the the mid '90s, but I was reading Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality mm-hmm. theories. You know, as as they were coming out, uh, "Racing Power and Gendering Justice" was a really important book for me. Um, Foucault and Said and uh, all of these writers, the Kambahi River Collective, all of these people that I was reading while I was in school would become very important or were very important to me and helped sort of ground my thinking in a lot of ways. But none of them were directly connected to Brooklyn in that sense or this kind of research. Yeah. Were there, through your research, were there any guides or maps um, laid out during that time that you cover for queer destinations? Mm -hmm. Not until, I think the earliest I was able to find was from the 40s. Oh, what is the name of it? It's it's uh, the Gay Girl's Guide to Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1940s. Yeah, Yeah. 1940s. But nothing, nothing before that. I see. Yeah, I've seen those ones. Yeah. Um, So did you know after high school you wanted to go to college for women's studies? No, no. I started off uh, in human development and family studies. I wanted to do child psychology. And then I changed my majors like 400 times. I'm surprised (laughs) I graduated, frankly. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you're doing well. (laughs) I wanted to circle back actually to um, like, so you said I got a grant from from the 
New York City Public Library or the New York Public Library. But like, what did that process entail? And then you got a um, another grant from the New York Foundation for the Arts. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we have a lot of young queer creatives listening in terms of like, applying and mm -hmm. that whole process. Well, uh, Martin Duberman, who's a really important uh, gay historian, established a grant at the New York Public Library to allow people to do queer research in their collections, and it, they give it out every year, and it's an incredible program. I highly recommend anyone who thinks that there is a project they want to work on that substantively needs them to be in that library to apply. It really is uh, incredible. And the application, I think at that time, I had to write a letter of intent and lay out why I needed to be at the library, what my project was, what collections I would be looking at, and maybe submit a sample yeah. of my writing, I think. I think there was a sample. And uh, references, a couple of people mm -hmm. who were willing to sort of speak to my ability to carry out my project. And they were really incredible. Uh, in terms of the grants I've applied for, it was a fairly easy one, as is the New York Foundation for the Arts. They give out, uh, I think they're on three-year cycles. So it's like one year they'll wow. do nonfiction and dance and, you know, experimental lighting design. And then the next year wow. it'll be sculpture, fiction, theater, you know, uh, and they're a really great program for New York artists. Uh, what I love about them in particular, the library, I was the only person who had that grant that year. NIFA, Amazing. there were a whole lot of us. And so they held receptions and we got to know each other. And I met oh, a whole nice. lot of other writers. And wow. that was fantastic. Yeah. And then you finished writing the book at a residency at the Watermill Center. Um, what was that like? I always assume that like, artist residencies are these like privileged things with like all white people. <laughs> uh, this one was interesting. So the Watermill Center is out in Long Island. It's um, a really incredible building uh, that has been turned into this like art retreat center. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful space. And they only have four artists there at a time. So when I was there, it was um, myself, a woman named Molly Joyce, who uh, played toy organs. She made like uh, neoclassical, <laughs> modern classical compositions using toy organs. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. A woman <laughs> named uh, Masako Miki from San Francisco, who does these incredible, giant, um, needle felted sculptures. Yeah, I, I know her. Oh, wow. Her work is yeah. so beautiful. It is. I love it. Being there with her was incredible. Um, and then a fourth woman whose name I am blanking on right now uh, from South Korea who does this experimental dance music projection work. So I was kind of the only one who had no requirements. Like I was like, I can sit yeah, anywhere. There's a chair, you know, just put yeah. me in a corner somewhere and I will happily work. They needed studio space and assistants and instruments and cameras. And, and so there was this really amazing like I didn't feel uh like we were in any way sort of in competition at all right. we were just doing such different things that it was like great to just be there and watch their process uh, and we got left completely alone and we could have done anything we wanted and yeah. they served us lunch and mm -hmm. i wrote for 12 hours a day i wrote so hard that um midway through the month that i was there my arms started to hurt all the time and i was like well oh. i don't have time to deal with this so i'm just going to ignore it and i finally went to <laughs> my me. doctor when the residency was done and she said you typed so much you broke your wrist oh <laughs> yeah. my god i have such limp feet wrists <laughs> that i can break them by typing and it was just one wrist that yep. i love it. just the right one so weird. Uh, she said i i stress fractured it uh so now um i, I sleep with a brace at night because it sort of has never recovered because i'm always <sighs> typing so much oh, god um, but oh, it was incredible yeah. so you didn't stay at this residency oh yeah yeah they had a little oh, house did. for us so okay. we all stayed mm -hmm. like a mile from the the center have you done any other residencies? Nope, that's the only one. Yeah. Renessa and I keep talking about wanting to do one. Yeah, together, like for yeah. the for the podcast or some other project, maybe will be born out of it. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> there, there were some collaborators there, some people who had uh, collaborators with them. It, yeah. was, it seemed like a great opportunity to just sort of spend time together and really totally. like hash out a project. Yes. When you when did you come out? Oh, gosh. Uh, I guess I started in 1994 when I was 16 and then kind of like fully came out right before I went off to college in 96. And your parents, how did they take it, family? 
we had a rough little time, but we got over it. It yeah. got a lot better. Uh, yeah. You know, I was I had older cousins who were queer, uh, who were sort of out and sort of not out. You know, that everybody knew, but nobody talked about it, kind of thing. Um, and then I came out, and they came out, and then my younger brother came out. There's a lot of gay people in my family, it turned out. Uh, but it took a little while to get that to be okay. And now we're on great terms. I love them. We hang out all the time. Mm-hmm. Did you see yourself as a journalist when you were younger? or No, I loved writing, and I thought it was completely impractical and something no one could ever do as a career. And just laughable, the idea that one yeah. might do it. Um, so, yeah, I loved it and thought I would never do it. And you yeah, it looks like... Sense? What's that? You've been living in Brooklyn since the school? Uh, Yeah. So I moved to Brooklyn in 2002, and I've been here basically ever since. I left for a little while to go to Berlin, New Orleans, (laughs) North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I kept moving and then coming back. I couldn't get away. Yeah. So it sounds like you also had a lot of different um, types of jobs while you were like in high school or college or while you were trying to become a writer. Um. Do you think getting like applying for the grants and then doing the fellowship and like what what was sort of like the turning point for you in terms of your career? I think I had to start taking it really seriously. So for me, that meant I went to graduate school to get my MFA in creative writing. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my biggest problem was not that I didn't know how to write, though there was a lot I needed to learn, but that I didn't know how to be an artist in my life. I didn't know how to integrate it. I was always talking about writing and never actually doing it. And so I went to a low residency program where I lived at home, I continued with my normal job, and I corresponded one-on-one with a writer. So I went to a place called the Bennington Writing Seminars, and that was incredible. It was exactly what I needed to kind of get me serious about my work. And everything changed for me as a result of doing that. I went in thinking I was going to write humorous first person essays a la David Sedaris. And (laughs) by the time I graduated, I was like, I never want to write about myself again. (laughs) I'm done. Uh, And I then started to find that I like to write about other things. I like to write about other people. And I was doing more and more journalism. And then I got Mm -hmm. into curating. And so for me, I think the big turning point was this moment where I was like, I need to be serious about this. And being serious about it means figuring out how it is a part of my life on a daily basis. And I needed help with that. And so I did do graduate school. Uh, I don't think anyone has to go to graduate school. But for me, it was useful. Yeah. Um, Do you love like the process of getting immersed in research? I really, I really did in grad school and having that like specific time carved out to do that was just to be like surrounded by books and Mm -hmm. like to discover a piece of information and then be like, oh, let me find out more about that. It's just I wish that like, I could have more times like that in my life. Same. I just love it. Yeah, it's the most fun. It's like being on a scavenger hunt where you have no idea what you're going to find. Yeah, absolutely. If if somebody's listening out there that was interested in going through archives, where would you even begin? Well, I think the first thing to do is find out what archives are near you. You know, if you're interested in just sort of learning how the archive works and how you can do this sort of research, see what's in your area and see what they have. Uh, Most archives have research librarians or staff who are there to help you, and they will sort of teach you how to work in that archive, how what you can do, what you can't do, how you can conduct your research. I didn't know a lot about archival research before I started writing this book. And so I sort of learned each archive as I needed to know how to use it. Right. Librarians are like goddesses. Yeah. Honestly. They are so much to all of them. Seriously. They've been my favorite people since I was like eight years old. We had a library about a block away from my house growing up, so I spent a lot of time there. Aww. Um, do you see yourself – well, you mentioned the the book that you're currently working on. Yep. Do you see yourself diving into any queer is- – did any other queer issues come up through the research of this book that will um, influence anything other than what you already described Um most likely, yeah. I'm sure there's there's so many threads to this book that I think deserve much more research, uh, particularly because I really start to end in the 50s, 60s, before Stonewall. And there's obviously been so much queer history of Brooklyn to happen after that. 
I, in my sort of dream of dreams, would love to help others or edit the book that comes after mine for the queer mm -hmm. history of Brooklyn. I think that there are people alive who are much more involved and connected to the communities that they would be documenting who I would love to see write that book so that then I could read it. Um, but there are a lot of little individual threads, just people who I thought were so interesting that in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe maybe when the prison book is done, maybe I'll return to one of yeah. them and write a biography. How many hours a day do you write? Or do you commit like that? Or is it more of when you get the failing? It's uh, I don't I research many hours. Uh, writing for me is always the last step. I, I can't sit down and write until I have most of my research together. So mm -hmm. I haven't written a single thing on this new book, though I've been working on it for over a year. Um, so I would say that, you know, I, I also I have a day job and I teach in an MFA program. Uh, so I say maybe three days out of the week, I get to focus on my writing and my research. What's the day job? I work at a place called the Urban Justice Center. It's mm -hmm. a nonprofit that does uh, legal advocacy on behalf of sort of New York's most vulnerable, although now we work uh -huh. around the world. And I've been there for 13 years. I, I do data entry and I plan events. It's a very low level job. So it's a place I feel really good about and I care a lot about, but I, I don't have to take my work home with me at the end of the night, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. We should talk too a little bit about the pop up museum of queer history. Yes, it's on hiatus. I will say oh, that's okay. the, the thing. Well, you know, um, you've, it, you can yeah. only juggle so many things. So yeah, it's, it's been on a long hiatus. Uh, it was a communally formed organization. I did the first show uh, on my own. It was just a, a somewhere between an art party and a conceptual exhibition. You know, what would it look like if we had a queer museum run by queer people in queer space devoted to queer history? And when 300 people showed up for a one night party, I knew that there was this real interest, but I didn't have the energy to carry that forward and yeah, didn't even know what it meant. Lot. So a bunch of us got together and for a good seven years, we did shows around the world. And that's a um, long time. Yeah, it was yeah. really fun. We worked in local communities to kind of say, what can we do to bolster what you already have? Can we bring in money? Can we bring in exhibits? Can we organize and sort of help draw out the local queer history in Philly or in um, Bloomington, Illinois? Uh, and so it was, or Bloomington, Indiana, sorry. Yeah. It was really fun. It was a, a great project that I highly recommend anyone listening. Like, I don't feel like I own the term pop-up museum of queer history if you want to create your own exhibit dedicated to the queer history of where you are i say do it it was a great way really, to learn how to do it yeah i would love to see the pop-up museum of queer history start a movement from sort of like where, what you started and then also different cities around the states and the globe um do a when one whatever city was queer oh yeah there are so many books. great books right now i mean there's a, a couple of them about london queer city and um queer london are both really fantastic there's queer berlin um mm -hmm. there's just all of these uh local queer histories popping up there's a really great one uh uh julio cabo just put a new one about miami called uh, good yeah. nights in fairyland i think or mm -hmm. it's, it's almost it but yeah there's yeah. it's great great time for queer history yeah start one in your own small town boys yeah. and girls <laughs> and email me if you do and you need advice i'm Get always Hugh happy to, to edit talk. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in your free time yeah i might take um, a while to respond but i will respond. i know you're there's also the walking tour video the walking tour of when brooklyn was queer um on new york magazine's youtube channel so that's a really great thing for people to just go on youtube and check out um, we'll I don't. Uh, so I haven't seen this. What What yeah. is this? This was just a fun uh, New York magazine before the book came out contacted me and they set me up with a team and we went to maybe six or seven sites in the book and mm -hmm. I did little intros to each one. Are you kidding? And, yeah, it was yeah. really fun. I'll watch that tonight. Yeah, yeah, really it was great. really good. And you were like such a natural. I like turned it off thinking you need your own like travel channel show or History something. Show. Oh, I would <laughs> yeah. love that. Yeah, I, I, I secretly channel, joke yeah. that all of this is uh, just a long application to get myself on Survivor. It hasn't worked yet. <laughs> I'm still hoping. I keep trying to convince my boyfriend to go on Amazing Race with me. Ah, <laughs> see, Amazing Race looks like a lot more fun. I yeah. think like it just seems like the like the. But yeah, I, Survivor. I don't know. I've been watching it for like I don't know 600 years now. It feels like, and I'm just like, oh, I want to do it so bad. 
I think it'd be I, miserable, and I would love it. Yeah, that I, I feel like I would be miserable. The bugs alone would get to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd be hungry the whole time, and I'd probably get voted out first, but I still want to do it. <laughs> now, when you were packaging this book together, um, did you have somebody in the um, literary world that you could reach out to that were opening doors for you to sort of pitch it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because there's a lot of people out there that um, get frustrated once they have a piece of material that they want to get out there and they don't feel as though they can get to the, open these doors. Well, I was very lucky. Right around the time I was finishing up that grant at the New York Public Library, my current agent, Robert Ginsler at Sterling Lord, reached out to me. He had read an essay that I wrote and said, you know, do you have anything that you're thinking of pitching? And I said, oh, yes, actually, I, I do. And I sent him the first version of the synopsis of the book. And he got back to me and said, I'm super excited about this idea, but you know, this this way you've got the proposal laid out, the book laid out, it's way too academic. It's not mm -hmm. gonna capture people. And so he gave me some advice, rewrote it, and then he was my agent. And so he took it out to editors and uh, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get it into editors' hands. Did you agree with his critique? Oh yeah, absolutely. He was totally right. That's uh, interesting. He told me to take it. I had it divided up by theme. Mm -hmm. which is, I think, more common in academic publishing. And he said, no, no, make it all chronological. You've got to have narrative. It's got to have story. It has to mm -hmm. build. And that was absolutely what it needed. Yeah, I'm trying to think it outside so of... Interesting. It's really well done. Um, so his advice is definitely... Yes, yeah, it was great. He's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of how you originally had the synopsis out and what that book would look like. Um, and yeah, I can see, I can see how that wouldn't work. Yeah. In terms um, of like appealing to different types of people versus just in like an academic type of, mm -hmm. of book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, is there anything in like current day Brooklyn, um, that, that our audience should check out in the five boroughs? Uh, so much. I mean, we already talked about the Lesbian Herster archives. If you yep. haven't been, you should donate $10 to them as a way of apologizing for not having been yet. And then you should go. Okay. <laughs> they are incredible. Yeah, uh, we'll put truly. a link on that. Amazing. On that yeah, I'm a huge fan. Uh, also, Coney Island. I think Coney okay. Island is one of the most special, amazing parts of New York. Uh, it's where I learned uh, the, the bearded woman at Coney Island actually taught me, or woman with a beard at Coney Island, Jennifer mm -hmm. Miller, aka Zenobia, taught me how to walk on stilts and how to slack rope oh. uh so i've always had this like very soft place in my heart for coney island and i highly recommend if you haven't been there or you haven't been there recently you know it's still nice enough days that you could go and have a good time um it's yeah truly one of my favorite parts of the city i go to the mermaid parade every year oh the mermaid parade's great it's so much fun, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So much fun. I've, I've actually brought my dog Sounds there every fabulous. year he loves it Sounds fab. And then uh, the one other place that I highly recommend is the Weeksville Heritage Center. Weeksville is that oh, yes. um, neighborhood, black neighborhood from the 1800s. There, it was lost to history basically until the 1960s. Wow. And these are four buildings that were known to have been part of Weeksville that have been preserved. And earlier this year, they actually almost ran out of money. And they did this tremendous yeah. fundraising initiative. But I think very few people... A, know that Weeksville ever existed, and B, know that the Weeksville Heritage Center exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and it truly is a place that will give you a vision of uh, New York history that you won't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the fact of the images they have there. One of my favorite uh, is referred to as the, the Weeksville Lady, I believe. And it's a black woman in a very Victorian garb, which we don't see very often, you know? Yeah. And so just seeing that visual record, I think, is so important in the same way that I found it so important to go see queer people in history. You know, like these things are important and I think they need to be preserved and shared. And I would hate it if the Weeksville Center closed down. Yeah. So if you haven't been, I also recommend donate and go. Where what is part Weeksville? of Brooklyn? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's basically today where Crown Heights is. Okay. okay. Yep. Do you know, is there a book on um, black queer history in America from the times that you sort of studied? Do you know? So there are some books. There's not a, a big general one. Uh, Kevin Mumford's Interzones, the one mm -hmm. that I recommended earlier, I think is really great. Um, uh, uh, C. Riley Horton, I think is their last name, has a book out that's really interesting on queerness and race. It's, it's quite academic, though. Um, 
there's there are a lot of books there is not a singular book i would say oh there is a really great one um oh gosh not white not straight that's a really good one oh. for 20th century history cool um, that sounds interesting i have to check it out yeah, yeah. yeah it has um, some great like scenes in it like the meeting between lorraine hansberry james baldwin uh robert kennedy and a whole bunch of uh, black power leaders, like a, yeah. a, a meeting that you can't imagine. And it's it's really well documented in this wow. book. It's really great. Sounds great. And lastly, do you have any advice for young queer creatives out there who might be listening? Take yourself seriously. And that was like, was the hardest thing. That's the like biggest that. thing. You've got to put in the time. If you don't take your own projects seriously, if you are not committed to them, if you're not willing to hustle them, if you're not, you know, spending your time on them, no one else ever is going to, you know? And it sucks because there'll be years where you're doing it and maybe no one's going to pay attention. But you've got to think it's important enough that you are going to pay attention to it no matter what anyone else does. Great advice. Yeah. Did you have anything else, Jonah? Sorry, I didn't mean no, to. No, I'm good. Did you have anything okay. else that you want to say? I just want to say thank you for having me on and, and thank you to your listeners for you know being interested in Queer Brooklyn. Of course. Thank, thank you. You're absolutely Hugh. delightful. You're awesome. Keep up the amazing work. And where can people find you online? Yeah. All over the place. HughRyan.net is my website. I'm on Twitter at Hugh Ryan. I'm on Instagram, but I check it like once every six months and I never post <laughs> anything. So it's really boring. Don't follow me there. Okay. Uh, I yeah, also have you're a Patreon. more of a words person. Oh, cool. What do you have the Patreon for? The Patreon actually is for my ongoing research. So it's a place where I share things Amazing. that I can't share publicly, generally because I don't have the rights to them yet or anything like that, or just notes as I'm going. So if people are interested in, in the queer Supporting. history of the women's house of detention they can find out more by following my patreon that's amazing oh, we'll put up super that smart well. thank yeah thank you so much you thank you both thank so you much here. this is really fun bye yeah. guys bye. bye thanks for listening to the podcast if you like what you heard or even if you didn't please leave us a rating and a review on itunes and follow us on Twitter at Creative Queer and Instagram at The Queer Creative Podcast. And you can now watch a video of this episode on our new YouTube page titled The Queer Creative Podcast. Visit our website, thequeercreative.com and submit your work to be featured or send it to us in direct messages on social media. Thanks, Thanks queers. queers. Bye. <laughs>